So, um, as alluded to earlier, we can envision this evening as a conversation. Uh, I have uh, an outline to give you my crutch. We will meander from it, and um, we hope to have time at the end for questions uh, from the audience when we conclude the initial portions of our discussion. So, again, I'm my name is David Goodwin. Um, I am the co chair of the Historical Society of the General Lewis Committee, despite having by far the least care of any. So, we have that wonderful overview from Stephen Younger by just now giving our, uh, the idea of your careers in a nutshell. But I'd really like to start tonight's conversation at the beginning by the sort of core question. What brought you to your career as a law? And what pointed you towards that path? Whichever one of you would like to start. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to begin by saying that Pat and I are both totally persuaded that if we had ever been adversaries in any case, we would never have married. It's true. Uh, okay, what, what, <laughs> what, what got me to the law? Uh, it was sort of a simple story. I, I went to St. Francis College in Brooklyn, and as you heard, I played basketball. My grandchildren don't want to hear any, hear any more about that as does everyone else in my firm. But in any event, I, I met a fellow there who was on a basketball scholarship with me named Tony Massimo. Tony lived in Long Island City. We palled around together, and one day he came up and said, Roy, you know what I do with my spare time is go down to, f to the, the courthouse down in the heart of Brooklyn and listen to trials. It's really exciting, and I think I may want to be a lawyer. Why don't you come with me one day and see what you think? So I went with him one day, and I don't know what it was about it. It was probably the same competitive thing that I experienced in sports, but I, I liked what, what I saw. I liked the way the lawyers behaved. And even after Tony left school after the first year, I kept going to court to watch the lawyers, to watch the judges and the parties. And I just became more enamored of the idea of maybe I could be a lawyer. There were, were no lawyers in the Reardon family, far be it. Uh, my dad was a, was a printer, basically. He worked in a print shop for, at uh, Fordham University. <clears throat> and when the Depression came, and I was born, incidentally, just so you know it, uh, I was born in 1929. My birthday is next Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be 88 years of, of age. I spent 60 years at Simpson Thatcher, and I loved every single minute of it. It was challenging. It was exciting. Every day I came in with anxiety. Now that can be bad for you if you take it too seriously, but it's part of the way of life for a lawyer. The excitement of coming in and knowing there's somebody out there who's coming after you every single day. <laughs> and often it's more than one. But it, I found the idea very challenging. And then when I got to Simpson Thatcher, I fell in love with it. And that's, that's where I began. Tony Massimo introduced me to the courthouse. I found I liked it and thought I could live there and work there. And that's where I wound up. That's it. So basically, we're both two kids from Queens. And um, I was a middle child, uh, very blue collar background. Uh, the first in my family to go to college, much less law school. And when I was in college, I was an English major and a history major, and you know I thought I would teach. And uh, then I started to take the required ed, ed courses. I hated them. And I had a professor who actually did a great favor for me. She said, you know, unless you're going to teach gifted children, you shouldn't teach. <laughs> and she was right. I mean, I had no, I had no patience. Um, so 
I had done some debating in high school. I went to a Catholic all-girls high school, the Mary Lewis Academy in, in Jamaica, Queens. And, and I watched Perry Mason on television. And now I have heard this story from Sonia Sotomayor, who I told, who was a friend. I said, Sonia, I think you're stealing my story. Because I would watch Perry Mason and say, gee, I did debate. Maybe I could do that. I can, I can talk on my feet. And so in my senior year of college, I applied to law schools. And I was accepted by Fordham. And I went to Fordham, and it was great. Um, and I had a, a terrific experience and a terrific career. So that was the beginning of how I went to law school. So you finish at Fordham then, and you have to start that process of applying for the first job. Um, and you know from uh, Mr. Younger's biographical sketch where you ended up, I'd love to hear about how you got that first job. <coughs> well, <clears throat> the, the interesting thing about my career, which has been, you know, wonderful opportunities, is that in those early days, I think I got every job because I was a woman. Um, you know, I graduated in 1966. When I went to Fordham, there were eight women in my class. There were four who finished. And um, this was the Vietnam War, right? So there was a, a chief judge of the Eastern District of New York was interviewing for clerks. At that time, they no longer would give a draft exemption to clerks. They used to, but they didn't anymore. So all of a sudden, I became a candidate. I mean, I, my qualification, I was in law review. I was at the top of my class. I was qualified, but that didn't work. I was not going to be drafted. That was my basic you know, criteria. And so this judge was, was elderly, and he said, if I hire you, you're going to be the first woman law clerk of the Eastern District of New York. I have no idea whether that was right or not. And, um, and then he said to me, but uh, I'm going, the clerkship is two years. I'm only going to hire you for one year, and let's see how it works out. And then I'll decide at the end of the first year whether we'll continue for the second year. Now, I have no idea where I got the guts to, or a voice to even say this. I said, that's fine, but I'd like to have the same option. <laughs> So he, of course, of course. So at the end of the first year, I got a job at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And he said, oh, we'll continue. And I said, no, I have a job in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District. I'm, I'm leaving. Um, I will also say, and, and maybe I, but anyway, among family, the entire year he called me sweetie. And I kept saying to him, Judge, you can't do that. I mean, people come in here. You cannot do that. Oh, sweetie, don't worry about it. <laughs> so then I went to the US Attorney's Office. I'll just do this little segue. Because when I was interviewing in the US Attorney's Office, they had one woman. And she was leaving to go to Washington because her husband had gotten a job in Washington. And I was going through the interviewing process and doing OK. So they offered me a job. So they thought one woman was enough. So the picture that they're handing out, you see that this is in November. I went there in October of uh, 67. This was taken in November of 67. And here I am, the one woman behind Bob Morgenthau in a sea of dark suits. Um, but it was a great experience. And I was told that I couldn't go into the criminal division and this really, I've always said this, and it's true. It was not Bob Morgenthau. He had a chief assistant, Silvio Malo, who didn't really want women in the criminal division. Why? He didn't want to curse in front of a woman. So finally, Morgenthau came to me and he said, you know, you can go in the criminal division. And I said to Silvio, Silvio, sometimes I use those words. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll do fine. So anyway, that was the start of a great career in the US Attorney's Office, I mean, for the opportunity that I had. Well, the change really was when I went, I was the one. I left in 1982, 50% of the office were women. That was the dramatic change in that period of time. That 15 years, and the women did great. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, first, I have to say I'm a graduate of St. John's, and I see many St. John's people here tonight, including its dean and Professor Barrett. And Carmen. And Carmen, of course, uh, Judge Separic. Uh, so I went to St. John's, and I came out of St. John's and went into the Army, because in those days, you had to go into the Army if you were fit and served two years, and I did that, and came out in 1956 and interviewed at Simpson Thatcher. The interviewing process was very unusual. If there were 20 partners in the office that day, you would see 20 partners if they had the time to, to meet you. They would take you into an office of a partner who would be the partner who would lead, be leading you through the day and introduce you to the incoming partners as they came in the door. And you'd spend 10 or 15 minutes with them. It was a fascinating bunch of people. Whitney North Seymour is a name you may not know, but if you're my age, you do. And some of the, some of the folks here do. He, he was a great, great man, a great litigator, a great lawyer and the leader of the firm, in certainly in terms of litigation. Cyrus Vance, who had just become a partner at Simpson Thatcher on January 1, 1956, was a partner at the time. In any event, they all came in and spoke to me that day, all who were there, certainly Whitney Seymour, certainly Cy Vance. Cy Vance was a young, handsome guy. He was uh, vigorous. He was had proven himself already as an associate of the firm handling some very significant litigation. And he, he worked me over. And I think young partners are like that. I call it sort of partneritis, which young partners get. They become <coughs> sort of authoritative, assume the role of partner, and, and take an interest in these kinds of things. And he did. The net result, I called him Mr. Vance for the next 15 years, <laughs> never called him Cy, not even Cyrus. But we got along and it was a wonderful experience. In any event, that's how I got to Simpson Thatcher. At Simpson Thatcher, they made me an offer and uh, I only wanted to do litigation. They asked me what I wanted to do and <laughs> litigation fit into what they needed. I had been in the court system watching trials down in uh, the courthouse down at, at uh, Borough Hall, and I really wanted to do it. And I got the opportunity, and my thought was, Simpson Thatcher was a great law firm. It was one of the bigger firms in New York at that time. <clears throat> it had all of 99 or 97 lawyers. That's it. The big firms had maybe uh, that number, or maybe a little more or a little <coughs> less. But that was the way it was. Today, Simpson Thatcher is probably 900 lawyers worldwide, 10 offices outside the United States. In any event, when I went there, I was a kid from St. John's from Queens, and I figured my life expectancy at a firm like Simpson Thatcher would be as long as I was proving myself to be really a valuable piece of goods. But I figured that would be about three years. So I decided three years was my life expectancy at Simpson Thatcher. And I decided in those three years that I would do everything I could get my hands on. I would take <coughs> every piece of what other associates thought was not moving them in the right direction, and I would do it if I could get a chance to do it myself, to be number one on a piece of legal business representing a client. And I was fascinated by that. And I, I fell in love with Simpson Thatcher. They paid, I'm going to tell you how much I made to start, and you'll be astonished considering today, I think the Wall Street going rate for incoming associates is $180,000 a year. I made $4,500 my first year. When I made $10,000, I was, 
I was almost shy about answering the question, how much money do you make down there? Because I thought it was too much. In any event. <coughs> the Gambino case. <coughs> you want to get to the Gambino case. But my wife always reminds me to stay on topic, <coughs> which I am very grateful. Mike Seymour was Whitney Seymour's son. When Eisenhower was elected, the U.S. Attorney's Office in, throughout America was pretty much swept clean. The Democrats had reigned over those offices for umpteen years while Roosevelt and Truman were in there. When Eisenhower was elected, there was almost a clean sweep of the offices in the district attorney's offices in the <coughs> southern, eastern, everywhere. And Mike, immediately upon the Eisenhower election, joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District, became a, a superb assistant. I tried a case with him. He was really good, could really speak. And he called me one day. He came back to the firm after s serving two, three years and called me and said, Roy, I've got a request from a judge in the Southern District, Judge Bix, and he has a case in which he needs two pro bono lawyers to represent indigent defendants. It'll take about three weeks. Would you like to do it? I said, yes. What else could I say? He was Whitney's son, and I took the case. And that's how I got into this case, and it was the Vito Genovese narcotics conspiracy case. And I represented one individual defendant, a really small time guy from Manhattan around 105th Street is where he lived. He was not a big time crook. He was just a regular guy who had a son, a wife, who worked in Sunshine Biscuit in Queens, took the subway to get there every day, worked for him so that he could be a carouser. <clears throat> he was not a bad guy, though, but he, he lied to me right off the bat. He gave me his alibi, that he worked in a bakery, so he couldn't have done and been where they said he was going to be or had been to perpetuate the conspiracy. In any event, uh, I went to that bakery, and of course the bakery was no more. The, the buildings, the housing was totally torn down. The, the projects were put in, and people were living in the projects. And the whole idea of the bakery, he ultimately admitted to me later on when we became pals, that he was just telling me that to keep me busy. And I went up to the depths of Manhattan, dark of night, to do the investigation, because I was still working at the firm. In any event, that, that's how I got this case. And it was a fascinating case. We had all the best criminal lawyers in New York representing those defendants who could afford to pay. And I got there to watch them in action. What an education it was. I learned so much. It was a huge case, and I had it for myself representing my client. I'm not going to mention his name because <clears throat> I'm still pal pals with his son, who went to work at Simpson Thatcher at my suggestion, and ultimately became involved in the accounting department at the firm, which made me a little nervous. <laughs> <coughs> But in any event, we are still pals. He, he became a, a vice president of a movie company. And, and uh, Pat and I have been to the movies on Charlie uh, ever since. He gets us these annual tickets, which are, get us into the best movies that are out there. Did the trial actually last just three weeks? No, the, 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 the trial went on for three months. <laughs> I had the case for three years. I went to the Supreme Court twice. What a thrilling thing that was, to get a case on the way to the Supreme <coughs> Court, hoping the Supreme Court would hear it and take the case and 
we had a chance because his involvement with the case was peanuts. He really had no significant involvement, but all you need in a conspiracy case, and, and one of the great judges in the Supreme Court described the law of conspiracy as that darling of the prosecutor's office because all it took was one overt act and you were in the conspiracy. And everything that every other bugger in that case did, according to the proof, came tumbling in on top of you when that conspiracy was proven. And it was in our case. And I got all the stuff coming in on top of me that Vito Genovese was alleged to have done, et cetera and all the bad guys. There were 19 of them. I went to the Supreme Court, and the reason I kept the case, Edward Bennett Williams, is that a name any of you know? One of the great lawyers of all time, trial lawyers. He came in representing Vito Genovese. When I heard that, I said, I gotta stay with this appeal. I gotta watch Edward Bennett Williams, this great lawyer. And he was truly superb in the courthouse, in the courtroom. He could cross-examine in, in the gentlest way, but most probative way you can imagine. And he had a way of becoming friends with the criminal bar, bar that was in the case, and also the criminal defendants in the case. When we went to lunch together, he was <coughs> Just pals of all of In any event, it was a case that changed my life in the sense that nothing after that for a long time was nearly as exciting as my having this defendant as my own client in that case. I thank Mike Seymour, and I thank you for letting me talk about it. Right. Well, first of all, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> being able to be an assistant United States attorney gives you the ability to have cases assigned to you and to try those cases and to take them as far as it will go. In the Southern District, we handled all of our own appeals. So you would get a case, <clears throat> uh, agents would bring a case to you, you would be involved in the investigation of the case the indictment, and the trial. And uh, it, it was a fabulous experience. I mean, coming into a courtroom, of course, I was the only woman in the office. And I have, I, I went to law school with a, a dear friend whose father was on the bench at the time in the Southern District. And he said, he called her and said, tell Pat that Judge so-and-so, who was an elderly judge and was hard of hearing, um, went to the judge's dining room and he said, they have a woman in the U.S. Attorney's <laughs> office, but she's got a big, deep voice. You, I can hear her. So, of course, I was, <clears throat> I was prepped before I went in front of him to speak loudly because he was hard of hearing. So that made an impression. Uh, it, it, I, I just have to touch a little bit on those days when I was the only woman. Um, it was very interesting. Um, I would go into the courtroom, and whoever the defense uh, attorneys were, the next time they'd show up, they had a woman. I don't know who she was. She could have been somebody's secretary, paralegal, never spoke, but there was a woman at counsel's table. And as the years went on, I mean, they, they had more and more responsibility. And um, it's funny, I was in a case in San Jose. I was representing the city of San Jose, and uh, the lawyer for one of the defendants came up to me and he said, Pat, I'm bringing an associate in. I want to give her an opportunity to cross-examine. Will you please go easy on her? I said, well, it depends upon whether it's in the interest of my client. But you know, women could see that I was in a courtroom doing it, and they felt that they could do it. And a lot of the judges said to me that they 
as the years went on, they had women law clerks, and they'd say, go back, go down and see Pat, see what she can do. You can do that too. And so, you know, the, the, the women started to understand that they could do this uh, just as well, if not better, than, than some of their colleagues. And um, it was a tremendous experience because it's not like you're the, the, the lowest person on the, to on the totem pole. You're it. You're, you're doing it yourself. Terrifying. Terrifying. I mean, you start off with the small cases, but then you get to the larger and larger cases, as I did. So um, I don't think you can duplicate that experience. And there are very few offices where you can duplicate it. It's usually a government office or the Legal Aid Society uh, or the district attorney's office where you get the full-on responsibility and you sink or swim on the basis of what you do. And <clears throat> it's tremendously demanding. Doing litigation is tremendously demanding. Uh, lots of areas of the law are demanding, but litigation is demanding. And um, so I was, I was fortunate. And, and there again, I think that it was an advantage to be a woman. Uh, the defense attorneys were a little afraid to beat up on me too much in front of a jury, you know? And I tried this case, the big land fraud case, um, and Peter Fleming, who was a Curtis Malay, and John Sprizzo, his partner, who later became a judge, were among the defense lawyers. It was, that was a case where it had a whole array of defense lawyers. And the interesting thing is that Peter and John both interviewed me to come to the US Attorney's Office. And they recommended that Bob Morgenthau hire me. And uh, we went through this trial, and Peter is a superb trial lawyer. Six foot four or six, gorgeous. You know, the juries were drooling over him, you know? And at the end, he, he used to cry in his summations. So I said, Peter, you cry in your summation, and I'm going to hand you a handkerchief. And of course, I was like five foot two, and I'd stand next to him and look up, and I, I mean, the jury knew that, it was, uh, you know, and I won. And Peter said to John, I told you we shouldn't have hired her. I mean, so it was great that you could get to the point where you are doing combat with the giants of the trial bar. And um, it was a great experience. And do you feel like that was an experience that the government kind of uniquely afforded you because you were Yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, listen, the reality is in, in firms, um, small, medium, and large. Um, they depend upon clients that retain them. The clients uh, have a relationship or, the, you know, a re uh, they've been friends with some lawyer and they decide that they want to retain that firm. That client doesn't want to be told that the most junior person on the team is going to argue the appeal. They just don't, that's not, uh, what happens generally. It's actually getting better because the, the firms are realizing that they have to give more responsibility. But the government jobs, and, and I'll just put in one pitch, pro bono work also gives you that opportunity. You, when you do pro bono work and you get the opportunity to represent a client, that is your client. And you get to go to court if that client has to be in court. So pro bono gives you a great opportunity to um, do work that you might not get in whatever firm setting you're in. So, considering on the theme of war stories for the moment, you mentioned earlier how you took the mob case almost up to the Supreme Court. But as I know, you managed to make it there at least twice and argue cases in the Supreme Court, once in 1986 and once in 2000. Um, can you talk about your experience arguing before the Supreme Court and what you found different between your first and second times there? I have developed great respect for <clears throat> the staff of the Supreme Court justices, the, the clerks. They are really solid. And I sort of relied on them in one, the most recent case that I had there, because I didn't get much solace from the court during the course of the argument. I argued the first case in the Supreme Court before a bench which consisted of Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia had just about joined the court. He was a wonderful, inquiring, 
personable, delightful person to be on the bench asking you questions. And couldn't great judicial atmosphere created by his questioning. When I next came before him years later, he chewed me up like you would not believe. Just beat me up. And I had been warned, because we prepped the case, Georgetown Law School has a, a, a organization within it that takes arguments, uh, moot, ar moot court arguments, before a court they create. And they create the court out of largely former judges or former clerks who served in the Supreme Court. So you really get an active bench, and they go after you vigorously, but not the way Justice Scalia did in that argument that I had most recently in my life. Uh, the, the case was a fascinating case. It involved the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I represented a golfer who had been denied the opportunity to play on the PGA Tour because he required a golf cart. It was Casey Martin versus the PGA. We had won in the Ninth Circuit, and in came a new firm representing the PGA, which consisted of largely of clerks who had served on the Supreme Court. The quality of their briefing was superb. Their oral argument was excellent. Their attitude was sort of looking down their nose at this kid from Queens and who had rarely been to the Supreme Court. And at the end of the argument, Pat and I were married at that time. We left. And we both agreed that we were in trouble. And the reason we thought we were in trouble, because we got chewed up by Justice Scalia, and a couple of others chimed in. Other justices were superb and excellent and concerned about the case. In any event, the case remained subject to the court's review for about three months without a decision. And I began to think, I'm going to get a dissent. That, wouldn't that be wonderful if I got a dissent? And I, Pat and I would talk about the case and my expectation. And lo and behold, the way the Supreme Court works when they have a decision for you, they just have a clerk pick up the phone and call you at your office 9 o'clock in the morning and say, this is the clerk in the Supreme Court. And we have a, to advise you of a decision in your case, so-and-so versus so-and-so. And I won. I won 7 to 2. And I lost Scalia, and I lost Thomas. But the rest of the justices came in for me. Now, why did I think that happened? The Americans with Disabilities Act is a statute you probably don't bump into in the ordinary course. But it's intended to give the disabled a chance to participate, not to change the rules for them, play by the rules, Rules in golf are putting the ball, little white ball, as Justice Scalia called it. You got us in here to talk about this little white ball that people try to put in holes on a green golf course? I said, yes, Your Honor. That was, that was the way he approached the case. We were wasting their time. But in any event, it, it turned out well. And the act itself is intended to help the disabled. And in talking with Pat about it, I said, you know, the clerks are so good. They're going to understand that it took three years to pass that legislation, that the legislation has a wonderful reason for being. And it's to give the disabled a chance to participate. And lo and behold, they gave it to Casey Martin. And he was just superb. He's still around. We talk from time to time on the phone. He's a golf coach at one of the large universities in the Northwest, which is where he came from. In any event, that, that's, 
that's the story. The, the first case that I argued, uh, I hardly remembered it. It was such an awesome thing to argue in the Supreme Court. Yeah, yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I have it. <laughs> uh, I did listen to it, and uh, I was not impressed with myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's a great court. I mean, they have, they have great clerks, and it, the stuff they do is really exquisite. Not, not that our, our own New York Court of Appeals Judge Siparic and others, and Judge Rosenblatt was on the Court of Appeals as well. He's sitting in the front row here. Uh, a great, another great court, great to be before, and I've been there many more times. Pat's poking me that that means I should stop. Well, uh, it's, there's a, a value in, in lots of different areas. When I think about pro bono, when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I joined this bar association. And I joined this bar association because I was concerned that the defense lawyers were um, exhibiting influence in the committee's work, because they have wonderful committees in, in this association, um, and that the prosecution's voice was not being heard adequately. And I paid the dues out of, you know, and it, the salary was not great, but I thought it was important and I paid the dues myself. I didn't, you know, the government wasn't going to pay it. And from day one in joining this association, and I served on so many different committees. Um, I mean, they assign you to committees. Um, and uh, you can state your preference, but, you know, you can sometimes just be assigned to a committee. Um, you you get to expand. You get out of your little pocket and office and group. You get to meet people who are good thinkers, many of them leaders in their firms, leaders in their areas of expertise, and some of them not leaders, but who are on their way up. And it's a great possibility and opportunity to connect with people. And to, you know, if you do the work, you impress them. And um, so I would urge um, all of you to become involved in this kind of work. Because I'll, I'll give you an example I was telling David earlier. Um, when I first was uh, on a committee, it was, I don't know, the police something committee. I have no idea. And it was early, early on. And uh, many years later, there was a scandal in Queens. The borough president of Queens, Donald Manis, committed suicide. There was a bribery investigation going on. They were closing in. He knew it. And he had a deputy uh, borough president, Claire Shulman, who was really the policy merit program person. But everybody wanted to talk to Claire. And one of Claire's colleagues said to her, you have to get a lawyer. And she said, fine, but I want it to be a woman. And the lawyer said, and, and the, her colleague said, I have the perfect person for you, Pat Hines. I, he was on this police committee with me 12 years before. I, I, I didn't even remember it. But he was impressed. He knew that I had been a prosecutor. I had just left the US Attorney's Office. And so I took Claire around to every prosecutor who wanted to talk to her. I said, put her in the grand jury. She doesn't want immunity. She, she wants to tell us she wouldn't take immunity. And she's, to this day, she's having her like 92nd birthday. Um, she always says, Pat Hines saved my life. Well, the, the point is, I would have never gotten that uh, uh, assignment um, if I hadn't been on this committee. And so you can make an impression on people, and it's a great opportunity to learn, in addition to meeting people who may be helpful to you at a later point in your career. So that's one aspect, committee work. 
uh, Bar Association. Um, and they do good work. And there are a lot of opportunities in bar associations like the Justice Center here, the Young Lawyers Committee here, the Young Lawyers Committee at the Historical Society. Networking, it's all important. It, it shows you what's out there, it expands your horizons, it introduces you to people who may be introducing you to some employment opportunity or future client. Um, the other uh, area of pro bono, I mean, I, it's true, I've been on almost every committee in the world. Um, and, you know, it's very hard to say no when a judge calls and says, but you must, you know, I mean, go, oh, I must. I mean, what, what, if I ever appeared in front of that person, how, how would I say it? I said no. But it's all, it's all very helpful to your education and to your um, the growing maturity as a lawyer and, and as your responsibility to the bar and the judges know who participates. The judges know who is a contributor, who, who does give back. And that's very important. It's very important to your credibility. I also, <clears throat> I was president of this association. That's my portrait. <laughs> um, two years. Smiling fondly in all of us. Yes, and um, that was demanding, but so educational, and the reach of this association, 162 committees, international, it was fabulous. I also chaired the board of the Legal Aid Society. I had been on the board, and I was asked to chair it, <clears throat> and I agreed. And 20 minutes after I agreed, the then president came in to me and said, uh, we have a problem. I said, we have a problem? What, what's the problem? We have an operating deficit. I said, we do? I never heard we had an operating deficit. Well, we've just discovered we have an operating I said, well, how much? He said, oh, could be nine million. I said, nine million. Now, Legal Aid is a huge organization. 800 lawyers, you know, does incredible work. Funded by the city, by, you know, private uh, practice. But, well, by the end of the second week, it had gone up to 20 million. And we were literally facing bankruptcy. And I had a board of 54 uh, lawyers, all the major firms in the city, some corporations. Well, <clears throat> it was such a wake-up call. For the next two years, I did it full time. I said, I am not going to be the first chair of the Legal Aid Society to take it into bankruptcy. That's not going to, that <laughs> sentence isn't going to follow after they say uh, this is who, who did it. And, um, that was the most amazing learning experience that I've ever had. I mean, I negotiated with landlords in Brooklyn to say, I, I can't, uh, we're not going to stay in this space, we can't afford it. And he said, you have a lease and I'm not letting you out of the lease. I said, I'm moving on Friday. He said, you can't do that. I said, I am doing it. Got, I got the legal aid people to get their vans and the trucks for the, you know, whatever they came and we moved out. Landlord calls me Monday morning. Goes, what did you do? I said, I moved out. I can't afford it, and and I had given him two other options of law firms that wanted that space. So, anyway, it was an amazing learning experience. Um, but I, I'm not suggesting that you want to step into that <laughs> uh, at all. Negotiating I mean, with landlords there was up there was uh, so many sleepless nights, um, but. Serving on a board where you can make a difference and help is very important. So I think that uh, it's very hard because, believe me, the practice is demanding, the time is demanding, and that is really what, and, and you know, the billable hours, the almighty billable hours that the firms, you know, uh, demand and expect is very hard. But I think that the firms also understand the importance of pro bono and the importance of pro bono to young lawyers. And it's, frankly, I think a negotiating tool for you to use with your firm because um, so many of the firms in New York do tremendous pro bono work and they, and they get it. And it's, it, it, look at it as an opportunity. It's very good to do. <clears throat> Before uh, we stop this part of the conversation and move to the, depending on who you ask, uh, Phil Donahue, Oprah Winfrey, <coughs> Maury Povich part of the evening where I try to walk around with the mic. Um, I wanted to conclude with a very practical question geared towards uh, the young and aspiring lawyers in the room. Over your years of practice, you've had the opportunity to appear in front of innumerable judges, some of whom might be in this room. Um, what advice would you give for new lawyers just starting their careers 
on the relationship between the bench and the bar, and do you have any tips? Uh, rule number one, when a judge asks you a question, answer it. <laughs> do not evade difficult questions. The judge is entitled to it. You will lose the respect of the judge if you do not respond to his or her question. That's rule number one. <coughs> Be prepared. I don't mean 100% prepared. People say, I'm 100% I'm ready to go. No. You've got to be 150% ready to go. 100 is not enough. You're not bleeding enough if you say you've got given 100%. We're, we're going into an aspect of the profession which introduces you to a life that is really rough. I mean, when I'm on trial, nothing works in my body. The machinery totally turns off or behaves in extraordinary ways, not for the betterment of Reardon. So you've got to give it all, and there's, there's, no, there's no way around it. If you want to be a litigator, you've got to give it all and you gotta be ready to do it, face the pain. Now, how do you help yourself? By working your can off to be 150% ready. You can answer any question. <clears throat> You're not challenging the judge. You're just being responsive and knowledgeable. And if you have those qualities, you're gonna hit a home run. The judge is gonna love you and whether, whether it's a, a, a male judge or a female judge, it makes no difference. They, it, they will fall for your persuasive, knowledgeable presentation. And that's the way they get ready. I, I would just add to that, that <clears throat> never mislead the court. Never be cute. Never misstate a case and say it, it's in your favor and it's not. Uh, you, if you don't have credibility with that judge, it will, first of all, it will get around. The other judges will know in, in a minute. And whatever you say, they will take with a grain of salt. And if, if it's a tough situation, you just have to acknowledge that it's a tough situation. And you know, I remember being in a long trial with the judge. It was a very difficult trial, and the judge liked the defense case better than the prosecution case. And I remember standing up saying, I can tell you in that case where it's cited. It's in the second column, blah, blah, blah. And the judge said, if she said it's there, it's there. I've dealt with her enough. I know that, I know that she's telling the truth. You have to get the confidence of the court that what you are saying is accurate and that they can rely upon it. You can never embarrass the court. Because there may be times where, where a judge has a huge caseload, a lot of pressure on them, and they accept an argument that you made in your brief. And it wasn't pointed out by the other side that you were a little slippery with that citation. And the judge uses it. And then the judge gets caught on appeal or whatever. It's terrible. Credibility after preparation and answering the court's question is paramount.